You are welcome to this introduction to Lesson 15 on the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 28, through chapter 13, verse 25. Most of the material that we shall share with you here in this video can be downloaded in documents from our website at hebrews.cura.download. Without further ado, let's get into it. The English version of this passage begins, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our text was composed in Greek, in the third quarter of the first century CE, probably by Apollos of Alexandria, a co-laborer with the famous Apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus. The passage was very well preserved through the centuries, although a few minor changes crept into some later documents by careless copyists. For example, in 1227, a few manuscripts read, We are grateful, echomen, instead of let us be grateful, echomen, and let us offer, latreomen, instead of let us offer, latreomen, one manuscript read, We shall offer, latreosomen, and another manuscript reads, We offer, latreomen. The pronunciation of some Greek consonants and vowels differed from region to region where copies were being made. Other copyists who were very familiar with the background stories of sacrificial animals being burned outside of the Israelite camp, in copying this verse in Hebrews, one manuscript replaced the word city with camp, whilst another reads city of the camp. In 316, one manuscript separates the phrase to do good from the phrase to share by inserting a definite article, the word the, before the phrase to share. We shall say more about this in the grammar section. As we just noted, there is a variant manuscript reading in Hebrews 316 where the English Standard Version translates, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. One of the oldest Greek New Testament manuscripts, Papyrus 46, dating from about A.D. 200, reads literally, The doing of good and the sharing forget not, making the two actions distinct one from the other whereas all other manuscripts read, literally, the doing of good and sharing forget not, linking the two actions. Thus, one may legitimately translate, do not neglect to do good by sharing what you have. We read earlier from the first verses of this section, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The Greek vocabulary here is important. For the verb to receive, according to the lexicons, means first to take into close association, that is, to take to oneself, and secondly, to gain control of something or to receive jurisdiction over it. Thus, this kingdom is not simply a kingdom in which we shall be invited to dwell, but rather we will have active roles in implementing the kingdom. The kingdom itself means first the act of ruling, that is generally kingship, royal power, or royal rule, and only secondarily a territory ruled by a king. Thus we are to receive ruling power. In chapter 13, verse 7, there is mention of our leaders. The term used here meant first to be in a supervisory capacity in any leading position, 
and secondly, to engage in an intellectual process. The verb can be translated to think, consider, regard. Thus, we're dealing here with intelligent, thoughtful, theologically guided leaders, individuals who provide leadership in our assemblies. In verse 17, we are to return their favor with our obedience. The term here in the passive voice means to be won over as the result of persuasion, to be persuaded, and hence to believe, to obey, and to follow. We are not mindless robots simply following orders issued by an hierarchy. We thoughtfully participate in meeting the goals of those whom the Holy Spirit has chosen to provide leadership. Most of humanity, throughout most of history, was ruled by monarchs, chieftains, kings, emperors, and their appointees. Most such rulers inherited their power, and many abused and exploited those whom they ruled. For example, a conqueror might appoint a new king over a defeated country, and the only way to depose a king was to shake his kingdom through assassination or invasion. Since this situation was still in place during most of Israel's history, and was still so in the days of Jesus and of early Christianity, the Bible employs the language of kings and kingdoms to teach principles of leadership and even to teach about divine authority. Thus, Hebrews 12.28 exhorts us, Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. This final section of the Epistle to the Hebrews is not very complicated. Dr. Westfall's discourse analysis points out that we are finishing, we are completing the third general section, We Are Partners in Jesus' Heavenly Calling, finally reaching the conclusion, which she summarizes as, Let us go to Jesus and offer sacrifices of love, good works, and sharing. The grammatical argument, or logic, of the passage develops the thesis, You have come to the city of the living God, from whence our writer draws two inferences. The first one says, Therefore, let us be grateful, let us offer to God acceptable worship, which is followed by several examples in the form of exhortations concerning brotherhood, hospitality, relief to prisoners, purity of life, contentment, loyalty, and strength from God, with the example of the Lord Jesus himself, who suffered outside of the camp. Second inference, therefore, let us bear the reproach that Jesus endured. With this explanation, after all, we seek a city that is yet to come. With four more exhortations concerning praise, sharing, submission, and prayer, with the great benediction, may the God of peace equip you to do his will, ending with a number of greetings. As you preach, teach, or guide others in their study of this passage, we recommend that you pose a number of queries and allow participants to discuss them, drawing their insights from the passage itself. Thus, after reading the verses 27 through 28, ask, what should be the attitude and practice of future kings? And let them find the replies in the text. Verses 1 through 3 in what ways are future kings to behave towards others? And in verse 4, what is the importance of morality for future kings? Going on to verses 5 and 6, what concern should future kings have for the accumulation of wealth? From verses 7 and 17, 
How do future kings treat their faith community leaders? Verses 8 through 10. From whence do future kings draw their beliefs? And as we move on, what is the importance of the gospel to future kings? What ought to be the spiritual disciplines of future kings? Continuing on with from verse 18, from whence do future kings draw their strength? And finally, under which of the original apostles' aegis or direction was this epistle circulated, noting that Timothy was the apostle Paul's apprentice, that many in Rome, Italy, accepted Paul as an authentic apostle of Jesus. As you preach and teach, be sure to underscore several classical Christian doctrines that have their origin in this epistle. For example, in verse 2, the future kingdom in which Christians will reign forever. Verse 4, the honorable estate of matrimony. Verse 8, the eternality of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, the sanctifying power of Jesus' blood. <clears throat> Verse 14, the everlasting city to come. Verse 20, the resurrection of Jesus from death. And verse 21, the everlasting glory of Jesus Christ. Our task for this week is to read through Hebrews 12.28 through 13.25 once a day this week in different translations. As we do so, we shall jot down notes and queries that we shall discuss together in our Bible study groups. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.